All right. Uh, well, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, Dr. Lockenbauer and I have some uh, kind of in exciting stuff to share. Hopefully some of this is new, um, but the first thing we'd like to do is set up uh, the, the stage for you, so to say. There are some incredible things happening right now in Russia with regard to the Arctic that when taken in a collective uh, perspective, uh, putting all the pieces together, there's something rather incredible going on. And what we'd like to do today is help put those pieces together and have a discussion about that. So the first part, what I'd like to do uh, for, for my part of the presentation is set the stage for you, right? What Dr. Lockenbauer and I have been talking about in recent months is all of this activity going on in Russia with regard to the Arctic uh, has to mean something. It has to mean something bigger than individual pieces. And we're starting to formulate an idea of how this is turning into a, a legitimizing grand strategy, all right? So, we're going to first discuss all of the huge pieces that were put together to get to this point. And then we're going to talk about something uh, that may be new to you all in the form of information operations. So I'll set up the big show for you all. And much of this should be a refresher. Uh, and then Dr. Lockenbauer will jump in with uh, some hopefully new information and a way to look at how Russia is communicating about the Arctic. And then we'll discuss potential impacts uh, and we'll go back and forth between him and I in sort of a discussion format uh, and then get to questions and answers. All right, to start off, these are some of the categories from which we started to organize our thoughts and look at how information, how the Russian government is structuring itself for what is about to be an exciting couple of years. First thing we look at is Russian policy efficiencies. There's been something going on with recent publications of major national level strategies, right? And one thing we, we explored was how is this possible uh, in Russia? What is the difference between democratic and authoritarian processes? Is it effective? And some just some basics to share. When we think about the democratic process involved with developing policies, implementing policies, it's much different from authoritarian. And when we consider how Russia does business, uh, some of these things matter with regard to the Arctic strategies, right? Primary stakeholder inclusion, those people that um, policy affects in democratic processes like the United States, Canada, there's great uh, community involvement. Uh, there's discussion, uh, key stakeholder input, uh, the different agencies have input, those who make the policy and implement it, they have uh, review processes and whatnot. All these things can greatly slow down uh, the policy uh, process, but they can be very enduring. They're also susceptible to partisan dynamics. Sometimes uh, elected officials are thinking about what they need to publish as far as policies to stay electable, so to say, versus the authoritarian uh, policy process not a lot of governmental interference. When Putin wants to create a strategy, uh, he doesn't really have to think about a lot of things that the democratic process has to think about. He doesn't need civic buy-in necessarily. He doesn't need to deliberate uh, with the primary st stakeholders, uh, nor does he have to worry about the agencies as much. However, there are some things that both Democratic and authoritarian regimes have to think about. Rulers can't rule alone, right? And we're you know, obviously seeing a lot of this in the United States, uh, as well as Russia, right? It takes a team to do this. If you want to pass successful policies, you have to work with others. And that's what we've seen recently. So that's led us to how an, a different way, an additional way to think about these new strategies that have come out with Russia uh, with, within the year 2020 alone, we've seen major policies published, uh, especially this most recent one. And to emphasize what I just talked about as far as authoritarian processes, nobody in Duma uh, had a chance to review this. There was no committee discussion and no members uh, of the Duma uh, had access to this developmental uh, strategy for the Russian Arctic zone. But as you can see, there's been several strategies uh, published in recent years that really set the stage for what is about to happen in Russia. 
Uh, when Russian strategy talks about the Arctic zone, uh, this is what they're talking about. Um, sometimes there's inclusion of uh, nearby areas that are extreme cold, um, but for the most part, uh, strategies, laws, regulations apply to this area I've outlined here. And uh, with that comes special provisions, uh, tax benefits, social programs, so on and so forth. Also, strategies often talk about the Northern Sea Route, and this is what we often see in the media and all over the internet when uh, the Northern Sea Route is being considered. This, in fact, is not even close to accurate. This is the Northern Sea Route, according to Russian federal law, and it's very important to understand this. The rest of the regulations and strategies that talk about the Northern Sea Route are not talking about these areas in the Barents Sea. It is this area between Novaya Zemlya and Cape Dezhnev only out to the EEZ. Something else very important that happened recently in setting up this grand stage, uh, Putin reshuffled his government somewhat with the help of Prime Minister Mishustin. On 9 November, he fired several people, key people that had uh, much to do with the Arctic. The Minister of Natural Resources and Environment, Kobilkin, uh, took the brunt of the uh, blame for the major Norilsk disaster. Minister of Transport being blamed for much of the lack of uh, developmental goals from the Northern Sea Route. And he hired Kozlov, who was the former uh, Minister of Natural Resources and Environment, uh, to uh, who was the former, sorry, he was the former Minister of the uh, Development of the Far East and Arctic. Uh, he promoted him to Minister of Natural Resources and Environment. Uh, and that's him there. Hired uh, Chekunov, who was a former CEO, to replace uh, uh, Kozlov. And hired uh, a new position for a new position, Deputy Prime Minister, the 10th position, uh, Novak. And the Minister of Energy is now uh, Shulingov. So major reshuffling there that has uh, some direct ties to the Arctic uh, were, were not missed by us. Russian Arctic Council Chairmanship. So here's what's going on. We have a lot of stuff that Russia has set up for the Arctic strategies, policies, long-term behaviors, consistent uh, discussion, rhetoric, narratives, you name it, all coming to this point where Russia is going to be the chair of the Arctic Council starting in May for two years. This is very important for them for many reasons of which uh, Dr. Lachenbauer will emphasize these points. This information, this communication is critical and the Russian Arctic Council chairmanship is gonna be this, this two year frame where Russia gets to emphasize and kind of control and steer this discussion and show the world what it is trying to legitimize as, as the, the definitions of the Arctic uh, in its terms. Okay, and this is where it wants to solidify so much work from many recent years. Recently, he signed a decree uh, standing up a committee to uh, help manage the chairmanship and prepare for the program. I think we have our friend uh, Michael Young here. He was a uh, former foreign service officer in the State Department working uh, for the Arctic Council, and uh, he can help explain how it can often take longer than the two years to actually be the chairmanship for the chair for two years. So it's very important and, and the preparations are, are important because the chairship offers an opportunity uh, to strategically conduct a massive PR event for two years and where you get to emphasize and show the world uh, your Arctic. All right? You don't necessarily control the Arctic Council by any means because uh, it's a consensus organization, but you certainly get to emphasize and show the world your Arctic. Russia is clearly planning to do this on a grand, massive scale. Okay, just to reiterate before we get into the information part, uh, these are some of the categories we've started to break our, our thinking down into and organize our thoughts. And into a lead up of information operations, this is quite important for Russia. Uh, they're very advanced in this regard, uh, whereas the United States and the West is a little bit behind in some ways, All right? During the Orange Revolution in Ukraine, uh, Russia failed miserably to employ information ops. Same thing during the Russo-Georgian War in 08. Uh, 
something happened after that. They reset their thinking and they got very serious about information ops. Uh, Garasimov here, the uh, lead military official for Russian uh, Minister of Defense, stated that non-military methods such as information operations in an article he published about information operations significantly surpassing the power of weapons. All right, and, and a statement like that from Russia uh, can can cannot be uh, overemphasized is how important this is. If their thinking is realigning uh, towards the importance of non-kinetic uh, approaches to to um, influencing the world, we need to pay attention. Right. Afterwards, they conduct what is was an amazing information operations uh, campaign in Crimea, uh, set up for several years prior in textbook example of unconventional warfare information operations had a huge part of this. Sir, the floor is yours. Great, thanks. And we're just going to swap uh, swap screens here so I can take uh, control of it here. Let's hope this works fairly seamlessly. Excellent. Is that showing up, Shannon? There we go. Excellent. Awesome. Just catch up here to where we're at. So just to pick up here, Troy has really framed up sort of the first silo of what we see as this constellation or ecosystems of different ways that the Russian state and its proxies and allies are communicating. So we've gone through and I think established the saliency of some of the strategy documents that are formal. I said former, but they're actually the formal ones that I'm trying to refer to here. And that those are something that in the case of Russia, I think we can turn to as a very reliable signpost of where Russia is intending to head. So I often see that we uh, have a tendency, at least in Canada, to sometimes lump together Russia and China and some of their behavior as a way of strategically communicating. What Troy and I are, I, I think, sharing and coming to a, a clear sense of is that for Russia, transparency in a different way than we often think about it in the West, but transparency and overtness is a key to being able to project and shape the environment that they're looking to influence and have been influencing for some time, but are continuing to influence going forward. So on the one hand, you've got sort of the formally state-sanctioned statements that are being put out, which Troy just gave you an overview of, and we'll be happy to speak about later. At the same time, you've got the state-funded global messaging coming out through state-funded foreign-facing media. Now, some people might say, why the heck is Whitney Lockenbauer commenting on Russia and what it's doing? He doesn't read Russian or speak Russian. My comment would be, this is intended deliberately to feed audiences, a disproportionate number of whom are English speaking. So the Russian machine is deliberately designed to put this material out there in English, in languages that will be absorbed by their, their target audiences. You've also got domestic facing media, of course, which Troy can speak to a bit if you have questions, the foreign based Russian funded state media. You've got various institutions, which we're not gonna talk about today in various countries promoting some of those messages, business associations, for example. Then you've got the proxy sources. You've got the Russian aligned outlets with global reach. And we'll give a couple of examples of those. And you've got to put this all together to understand the nature of the ecosystem that Russia is operating in. And I'm going to focus mainly on the second and third silos of this particular discussion in the next few minutes to hear your thoughts. So we've got, in essence, in this word cloud, a sense of where Russia is going, its strategy for developing the Russian Arctic zone and ensuring national security until 2035 came out in October. It's a, I, I find it quite a, uh, an impressive document. It's clearly comprehensive, has, I think, an excessively ambitious, but very clearly articulated uh, implementation plan broken down into three time horizons. It's not only yielding national level aspirations, but also adopting an area specific approach to looking at what implementation measures might come in. So we might talk later about comparing and contrasting the Russian model of what they've done over the last year versus Canada's process leading to the Arctic and Northern policy framework and ongoing discussions about potentially co-developing implementation plans that are not public. Uh, there's clearly a difference between what Russia has been able to accomplish in the same time frame compared to what Canada has, at least in terms of policy development and implementation planning. 
It's also interesting because these strategic documents are very much emphasizing themes that are going to be resonant with a lot of the other Arctic states. And when you look at the latest iterations of strategy, yes, they're still focused on a lot of the predictable themes regarding the Northern Sea Route as sort of the centerpiece, the key artery running through the strategy, as well as arguably Russia's economic vision for the region, a focus on oil and gas, a focus on economic development to be sure, but a much stronger articulation of the importance of increasing social and health indicators, stronger focus on indigenous peoples and so on, largely anticipating, Troy and I argue, the Arctic Council chairmanship and a way of legitimizing Russia as being the preponderant or dominant voice within the Arctic. So in terms of uh, my evolving understanding of the Russian disinformation and propaganda ecosystem, it's important to understand it's multiple media platforms. And Russia has devised a strategy where there's no pretense and in fact, no desire to try to have unified messaging across all sources. Instead, it's useful to have various overlapping approaches that cumulatively are mutually reinforcing. So when we're thinking about this in terms of narratives, we need to distinguish between narratives and topics and themes or individual stories. When we're thinking about the narratives of a whole, as a whole, we need to think about all these stories, all this assemblage of everything that's going on and how that shapes the minds of people who are reading it, how it shapes a certain understanding of the world. So what this Russian ecosystem allows is even contradictory messages to be operating, but leading to the same potential end state. And we'll talk about what some of those might look like. This means that you can have variation in false or skewed narratives to fit particular target audiences. So when you have official government policy direction or statements or strategies, there still is a need for consistency, not as much as there is in the West, but there's still a need for consistency, but this doesn't exist within the broader ecosystem in which these fit. And what this also does is facilitates the circulation of disinformation in various forms that's prejudicial to adversaries, while at the same time allowing the Russian state to disavow responsibility for malign activity. And we've seen this in some of the information operations that Troy mentioned before in much more overt and, and much more hostile contexts or, or explicit conflict zones, which are different from the Arctic. We're not drawing a direct parallel between what went on in Georgia or what went on in Eastern Ukraine with what's going on in the Arctic. But we have to understand the logic of what was happening in those zones to understand how Russia's broader ecosystem is functioning everywhere. Also, there's this potential for a multiplier effect as stories interact as you have circular validation between Russian official sources and proxy sites and proxy sites feeding other proxy sites to create a sense of sheer quantity that makes it look like something is legitimized. And by having all these different streams of information interacting in bursts, you also have confusion sowed for audiences that are trying to parse truth from fabrication or distortion or just propagation of selected Western narratives that serve Russian interests all going on simultaneously. I'm tempted to draw a connection to some of the strategies used by the Trump White House, for example, in some of its approaches to media communication. We might talk about that in question and answer here. Um, one of the most interesting works that I've come across at Troy's suggestion was this fire hose of falsehood model to explain Russian propaganda. That it's about high volumes of material coming out at selected times that are multi-channel, so taking different forms as we talk about, they're rapid, it's continuous, it's a barrage of information coming over the fire hose, and it's repetitive, and it's predicated on the psychological notion that first impressions end up being highly resilient, that whatever Russian sources can manage to get imprinted will very much frame subsequent understandings and subsequent discussions, and that through repetition of similar themes, even if they're somewhat contradictory and coming from different channels, this will yield a sense of familiarity. And the psychology around the familiarity of those stories will ultimately be conducive to audiences accepting of them. There is no commitment to objective reality the way we often expect our news sources to operate, right? RT and Sputnik, for example, resemble in some outward manifestations, Western media outlets, but it's a different form of news that they're propagating. And the idea is that there's even sleeper effects, certain uh, apparently benign sort of narratives that are fed out over time 
will become normalized, may not be countered by Western sources, and over time will be more convincing to audiences. And that even if you put out information that proves to be false, that's discredited, or that you ultimately retract, or that's proven false, having it out there in the first place still influences reasoning. And I always think of it as like the lawyerly tactic of putting something out in a courtroom, knowing that the judge is going to quash it down. But that once you've planted that seed in the minds of a jury, right, it's there and it can't be truly stricken no matter what the record might say. And also that this doesn't have a commitment to consistency. So it's interesting because I think that the framework here as articulated by Christopher Paul and Miriam Matthews from Rand Corporation suggest is several of these features run directly counter to conventional wisdom on effective influence from communication or government or defense sources. Where in the West, we typically emphasize the importance of truth and credibility and the avoidance of contradiction, but that that's not things that we can assume are going to be affirmed as important within this Russian ecosystem, which plays into Russian uh, state goals. So first category, looking at state-funded foreign-facing media, it's interesting that most Arctic messaging, Arctic messaging coming from Russia, is propagated by Russian mainstream outlets in quite traditional formats, and then it's disseminated by social media. So these are overt, attributable messages that amplify Arctic-related pro-Russian and anti-Western narratives. So to be crystal clear, the strategic goal how do you weaken the credibility of the United States and its Western allies and partners while at the same time enhancing the legitimacy? And Troy started with that word, and that really is the thread running through our argument here. It's about enhancing the legitimacy of Russia and projecting this message that it is the dominant, the dominant Arctic player. And this very much aligns with the core messaging that comes out of the strategies that, uh, that Troy referred to earlier. So what does this look like in terms of major messaging? For many of us, this is not going to be surprising, but it's certainly affirmed by our very deep and careful reading of a lot of this ecosystem as it's operating in English language media, at least. First of all, it's pro-Russian, promoting Kremlin statements, right? promoting Arctic development doctrine as articulated by Putin and some of his selected oligarchs, trumpeting up Russia's ice-breaking construction programs as being far ahead of the rest of the world. So there's no possible way that they could ever be matched. Highlighting the refurbishing and modernizing of military infrastructure that used to exist, also emphasizing their new bases, their new weapons, their uh, new air defense systems, especially a lot of emphasis in the literature on the Bastion coastal missile defense systems, trumpeting up their preponderance of troop strength and the sophistication of their major exercises compared to those being hosted in the West, which we'll come to in a minute. So really trying to evoke this notion and, and consolidate the idea that there's a superiority of Russian Western weapon systems in the Arctic region. And I'd say something that this is very much being messaged out as well in Western media and Western security circles. Obviously an interest in energy resources in the Russian Arctic, it's often tied to an argument that this is the real driver of US and NATO interest in those topics is because we're really covetous of Russian resources. Obviously, a lot of emphasis on the Northern Sea Route, which is key to Russia being able to make the strategic message that it only seeks stability in the region. It's an entire desired end state is not to be destabilizing or revisionist. It would say it's the opposite. It's to ensure conflict-free operations of the Northern Sea Route as Russia's economic artery. And then also affirmations of Russia's adherence to international law, respect for sovereignty, an openness to dialogue, and a readiness to discuss common issues. So all portending its chairmanship of the Arctic Council. So what are the takeaways to be pithy? Russia's superiority over the West, Russia's unquestionable legitimacy as the largest Arctic rights holder. And all of this works together as creating a legitimacy of its requirement to defend it's Arctic, which is rightfully, which it rightfully plays a central role with it. Other major messaging, obviously anti-Western, that NATO really desires to push Russia out of the Arctic, that our game is to deny its right to exploit its resources, and that all of this is justification for, as I said, for defensive Russian military capabilities to be built within the region. So the basic equation, NATO is the aggressor, right? Russia is the peaceful target, with rights that NATO refuses to recognize. And it refers, for example, to Canada-US exercises as provocative, 
that they're deliberately directed at Russia and show that Western countries are readying for confrontation. I put this out there because some of you within the audience right, will see a mirroring with the way that North American commentators frame and interpret Russian exercises. So they're giving it right back to us in a mirror image. Also messaging that emphasizes the weakness of Western states within the Arctic, right? US icebreakers are pathetic. They don't even have a nuclear powered one. Even China has more operational icebreakers than the US, right? The kind of theme come out. Uh, in terms of Canada, the Canadian Rangers being our only Arctic defenders. We don't have a naval port, by gosh. None of the Arctic states have naval infrastructure or Arctic infrastructure like Russia does, right? That NATO is unable to build anything significant north of the Arctic Circle. And also sort of laughing at the quality and scale and outcomes of NORAD and to different extent NATO military exercises to prove Russia's regional superiority. Again, inconsistent with the other narrative that talks about the threat posed by the Western states to Russia, but reaffir reaffirming the same sort of takeaway point of Russia being the preponderant actor, having legitimate rights that it needs to defend. And Russia, of course, also accuses the US of a very aggressive global disinformation campaign that's really setting up an imaginary Russian threat to the Arctic, which is all about feeding the military industrial complex and justifying its emerging defense posture, or it wants to cling to its unipolar moment, even though the world has moved on. I'm not saying that's Whitney Lockenbauer has taken, saying that's the Russian sources take. Also, last one here, sanctions hurt, but the key message is they can't stop Russia in the Arctic, right? And Russian narratives often focus on how these sanctions are actually hurting the Nordic states even more. So that's coming out of sort of the mainstream outlets. These are picked up then by Russian aligned misinformation outlets, which have global reach. I put up here an example of a Canadian-based website run out of Montreal by a retired University of Ottawa professor. I think the stuff on this website is kind of wacko. It's very obvious, so, so why would I put this up here? Well, I don't think it's particularly influential or transformative in North American circles, but in a, in a sense, these misinformation outlets, which are operating arm's length from the Russian state, I think help us to get a sense of what the logical outcome is or what the blunt framing or messages that's intended to be communicated. And it's interesting, even though it's not huge numbers of followers for these sites, they operate within this ecosystem where they obviously are reaching certain selected audiences who might be predisposed to acting upon some of these messages or propagating them through other channels to different audiences. So again, just a couple of sample stories here, right, that sort of reaffirm those themes. Interesting that they'll often you know, use it largely as a way of, again, discrediting the legitimacy of Western voices, discrediting the legitimacy of countries like Canada in terms of pursuing our Arctic policies, often accusing us of simply being a lapdog of the United States, for example, and often elevating and tying the Arctic up into broader narratives about what the US is looking for within the world in terms of energy security and so on. So, Put these all together, what are some of the topics that we might be tracking near term? Freedom of navigation, right? The Russian narrative that the West wants to deny Russian rights to the Northern Sea Route. The US unjustifiably claims it's an international state, but that Russia says in any case, the US doesn't have the power to force the issue because Russia has military dominance. So in essence, Russian is a, or United States is aggressor. US would like to push, but this is a demonstration of Russian superiority. Right? Also stories highlighting Canada's displeasure with the U.S. over its stance. Right? I would say that the Russian media is often very confused about Canada's actual position and how it compares to Russia's. There's not a real clarity in terms of the legal arguments, but why would there need to be, right? The only suggestion is that this is a potential wedge issue between Canada and the U.S. So when so much other narrative you have Canada and the U.S. as being linked together with their other NATO allies, as being aligned in this particular issue, you've got a sense that this is potentially common ground between Canada and Russia, which helps to discredit the United States' legitimacy. Another specific topic relates to Indigenous peoples. And again, I put this out here because here's an example of propagating Western media rather than inventing stories. So it's not about Russia manufacturing fake news. Instead, actively promoting and emphasizing how Canada and the US are guilty of committing genocide against Arctic indigenous peoples. How can I say that that's not fake news? 
because that's what our own prime minister in Canada suggested and acquiesced in terms of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, right? So what's going on here is, is another Russian tactic of propagating selective Western stories to feed a certain narrative. Why is this one important? Because amplifying poor treatment of Inuit and other groups means that countries like Canada then have no legitimacy in criticizing Russia or accusing Russia of violating indigenous rights. So in this particular case, the goal is to illegitimize Western claims that we respect indigenous peoples more than the Russians do. And this then absolves Russia of the need for it to have to make its case, or at least not having to make its case that it is every bit as much legitimacy speaking about these issues as we in the West do. Another specific topic on China, and I find this one is very interesting, that the Russian media acknowledges China's active interest in intervention in Arctic affairs whenever opportunities arise. So clearly that's there. But then this has to conform with Moscow's dominant official messaging that China is an ally, that it's an economic and political partner. So why then raise this in a context that's critical? Ah, because the Russian media can use Western voices to raise concerns about Chinese influence and investment, actually raise those issues in the minds of audiences, but be able to blame them on Western commentators. So in essence, it then can't be mis attributed to the Russian state or Russian media outlets of making these negative comments or disparaging comments about China, right? They can just say, hey, all we're doing is faithfully quoting from Western commentators. So it's a way of using the propagation of narratives about US concern about China, including the prospect of Chinese submarine activities in the Arctic as a way to get those messages out there to audiences, but then framing it as an issue that's a US China one at the same time as allowing this, if you can see, as an indirect way of expressing potentially wariness in indirect critiques of China's Arctic ambitions, where those might not be perceived as completely aligned with those of Russia. So the other aspect of this then is the foreign state narrative amplification, right? Something that's done by Russia in a, in a way that's very selected uh, and, and undeniable though, in this case, right? A way that you can just say, hey, I didn't write it. Don't shoot the messenger here. I'm just passing along what others are saying. A very typical tactic in Russian news media and social media. And I put this up because these are very difficult narratives to counter because these are not fake news stories, right? The way RT or Sputnik or TASS reported on Secretary of State Pompeo's comments to the Arctic Council, what they attributed to Secretary of State Pompeo saying were actually right on the mark. They didn't need to manufacture you know, false statements. Same thing about the US offer to purchase Greenland from the Kingdom of Denmark, right? The Russians could turn to that and show that this showed um, a US leaning forward and wanting to deal with the state and not going consulting with Greenlanders or not respecting indigenous rights, for example. And same thing with this language of cultural genocide within Canada. It's a way of highlighting Canada's colonial legacies and you know, applying a word like genocide in a very harsh way that is absolutely faithful to what's actually coming out of Canadian sources. So other considerations. You know, I just put this out there. Who are unwitting Western proliferators of Russian narratives? When we have critics out there of Western policy who naturally emphasize Russian superiority and dominance within the region, and it's often, right, this is on the hawkish side, right, a desire to secure more defense funding. What kind of a role are those individuals, including myself sometimes, playing in actually proliferating Russian strategic narratives? As well, when we look at some of the high-level language coming out of NORAD these days and U.S. NORTHCOM about Russian threats to North America, this notion of a U.S. expansion of its Arctic presence as a way to contain Russia into the Arctic is actually directly affirming or sedimenting some of these narratives that Russia has actually been carefully fostering over the last few, few years. The other question I ask is, should we expect Russian infiltration of northern debates? Is this something that might happen in the next six months? Perhaps wasn't going to happen in the last year, right? Where so much of the oxygen was sucked out of the room with the US presidential election, for example. But in the lead up to the Alaska Council chairmanship, is this the time when it would be useful for this Russian ecosystem to actually intervene, sow seeds of discord, right? We've seen that play out in the Nordic countries with the use of automated social media accounts to aggravate debate, debates over contentious environmental issues. Right? It played out in Canada with the Wexit debate in the last days of our federal election. 
Furthermore, uh, are we on guard about ourselves being guilty in the West of perpetuating misinformation and disinformation? Does this disempower us from even being able to counter criticisms of Russia for what they're doing? And I give an example of the Barents Observer story on Dmitry Medvedev's comments uh, from the 4th of October, which it was a story that came out and wrongly, I would suggest, connected Medvedev's comments about national security interests as a priority for Russia and suggested that these were linked to his statements on the chairmanship priorities for the Arctic Council. When, where thanks to Troy, who caught me before I went out and, and put my foot in my mouth by publishing something on this, said, actually, go back. I don't think that's what he actually, what he actually said. And indeed, you go back to Russian language source of the meeting, there's no suggestion that he linked the two issues. And I've made inquiries with Western officials in Moscow saying there's no evidence that it was linked. Yet Arctic Today and Radio Canada and the Jamestown Foundation wrote stories which suggested that this showed that Russia Russia was going to try and change the Arctic Council and use it for its duplicitous purposes to drive a hard security agenda. And I put this out to the audience saying, how would we read this if the tables were turned, right? If we were sitting on the Russian side of the poll looking at this, we'd say, here's the West generating fake news, right? That they have a deliberate state-sponsored misinformation campaign that's designed to undermine Russia's chairmanship. So again, I think I just put this out there as a complicating factor to say, how do we deal with all of this? Right? How do we deal with an open information offensive that has trolled us up with is really at its core about Russia's search to legitimize its dominant position in the Arctic. And that what we're really doing is monitoring a shaping environment and try, I'd love you to jump in and explain this to the group, right? Where we're not gonna find smoking guns, those looking for the absolute proof that Russia is intervening, for example, in a Canadian context, is going to be difficult and it's probably not the time where we're going to see that. Instead, what we need is a real careful reading and assessment of what's happening within this ecosystem, I would argue, by subject matter experts, because we need to carefully parse what is Russian mis- or disinformation from credible differences of interpretation that Russians will have and that we should expect them to have, from the propagation of Western narratives that we resent when an adversary turns back on us but are actually narratives that we're generating and are in some ways a reflection of our healthy democratic debate and dissent within our constructs of society. So yes, I, I argue this is, this is a complicated environment. These are wicked problems because they're blurred lines. Is it best to conceptualize all of this as information warfare? So is this something that requires a military response or are these influence operations best monitored and countered by their agencies? Is this something that our intelligence community should be dealing with? that our homeland security slash public safety community should be grappling with. And then if we do want to have a coordinated response, how do we coordinate messaging amongst allies, NATO, NORAD, without simply feeding the Russian propaganda grist mill in return? And in essence, battling them on their own terrain that they've already prepared for us. And how do we counter Russian narratives without succumbing to the same sort of propaganda campaign? How do you counter fake news effectively? Troy, do you want to jump in on this? Because I know you have lots of fantastic thoughts. Yeah, this is, uh, so this is sort of new for the United States in, in realizing that we're a little bit behind, if not a lot behind in, in this information domain, this cognitive domain that is um, a definable domain by defense standards. Uh, and if we think of a little bit about some context, historical context, um, and, and how Russia does this, and it's known as active measures, um, as far as a Russian program is concerned for information operations, we can trace back, and there's a wonderful documentary from New York Times on this called Infection, and it outlines how this worked, a very tangible case study of how Russia um, propagated a story uh, based on blaming the US military uh, for creating the epidemic of AIDS out of Fort Meade, Maryland. It started with just a simple story in the Polish newspaper that eventually landed on primetime news networks stating this uh, narrative that Russia had created out of nowhere, right? Now, but by today's standards, though, things have greatly changed, obviously, with the internet and the speed of relevancy and whatnot, timing, saturation, everything is different about how information works. And in, in this case, this is where 
if we're going to look for smoking guns and we're, we're going to expect Russia to conduct information operations in a way that's um, you know, we can point to and find uh, a smoking gun, it's not going to happen, right? It, Russia understands how this works. Everybody kind of understands how this works. So to leave yourself open to being backtraced and found as a source of misinformation, no one's going to do that, right? That's amateur hour. Uh, so instead, uh, this is where Whitney and I are, are thinking and looking for help from the experts on how does this work in the proxy method, right? How do you associate and attribute, get that traction, get that information out there in a way that's legitimate, but does not leave you open to, uh, to being traced as the source? Troy, can you also speak a bit to the shaping environment idea? Because this, this was a big epiphany. It was a big bang moment for me when you explained this to me about where we find ourselves right now or your assessment where we find ourselves sure thank you for that yeah so the way the military uh deals with this domain this information domain is in the phases and this is in the phases of major planning operations for uh, just about any mission set including information operations the shaping phase is, is is known as phase zero and this is where uh, lots of definitions uh, and aspects are being identified and defined and um, you're, you're kind of sort of in like symposium mode where there's just a lot of education going on and getting to the ground truth of, of the reality, right? Uh, this is, and once that, that occurs, uh, you decide on plans and a way forward, uh, a campaign uh, you dedicate to themes and, and uh, narratives uh, for information purposes and you create you start to create this plan on, on, on how things are going to develop for what would be the next phases. And mm. often in, in the military phases have trigger points of when you go from one phase to another, but that phase zero is a constant phase for all issues throughout uh, all kinds of military sets. So we are very much in phase zero shaping for the Arctic. This is going to be difficult for some people to understand because much of what we're doing around the world are in different phases. And as a result, uh, what we can uh, clearly ascertain is we are very much in a shaping phase. Russia is trying to define the Arctic in its terms. This is a phase zero shaping operation. And as a result, you're not gonna find that covert uh, approach to trying to shape and influence through information. It has to be done in the open. And it is being done in the open. So looking for the smoking gun is a waste of time right now. But the reason and the purpose behind that, this is very much new, I think, to the West uh, as we try to catch up. Uh, but we, we, I think we have a, a way forward in which we can do this. Luckily, because much of this is being done in the open, we just have to synthesize it properly uh, so we can get to some enduring results. Well, that's interesting. I, I put a flash up a slide here because we have Sergey Sukonkin, who actually writes quite regularly for Jamestown Foundation as well. I really like his stuff. Very, uh, very interesting thinker on this. He's sort of suggesting that we should be ready for a surge of, it, of uh, the, the next phase of Russia against Canada in particular. I mean, I'm not, A, I'm not typically a purveyor of polar peril like this. I don't see us um, as necessarily being top of the agenda. I think that's a little bit of overzealous fear mongering, but he's pointing to something, right? These are tactics, these are techniques that fit within the logic of this ecosystem that are things that we should be thinking about and anticipating for subsequent phases of this, this relationship. Why do I say not to panic? Because in the whole hierarchy of where, this is just taking one Russian source, for example, Canada ranks, I mean, I would be having a different conversation in U.S. circles, but to say, I don't think this is a panic. I don't think this is something where we're going to expect uh, an onslaught or an overwhelming amount of Russian emphasis in the next six months. But it does invite us to say, okay, if we anticipate that this is something that is going to happen, because this is the new way that operations are conducted and the new way that this multipolar world is going to function, how do we counter the fire hose of falsehood? So I'll take us back for a minute to Paul and, and Matthew's piece. We say, you know, traditional counter-propaganda efforts, forget about it. The world has changed here, right? Yeah, you got to point out some falsehoods and inconsistencies. But once these gain traction, like I alluded to before, it's really hard to actually effectively counter them. So don't expect the fire hose of falsehood, they say, 
to be countered with the squirt gun of truth, right? We saw this play out, dare I say, with Trump tweets, right? No matter what CNN tried to do, they couldn't keep up with the fire hose of tweets coming out. And it's a lot more effort to go and to disprove disinformation than it is to just manufacture it and throw it out there and propagate it. So one of the things is we need to be focused on forewarning. If you can prime potential audiences with correct, true information, this finds itself in the same role as a retraction or refutation would later, meaning it's going to be much more difficult for an adversary to convince people to change their minds on it, right? The burden of proof shifts. And what Russia, I think, is doing with some of its narratives is trying to shift it so that the West will face the burden of proof of disproving what it's claiming, which is much more difficult, as I'm saying, than making the initial assertion. One of the things they suggest is highlight how propagandists attempt to manipulate audiences. It's not about getting pulled down into the weeds and fighting specific manipulation. You've got to explain to audiences the logic of how this works. And then as the next point says, give people raincoats who are going to be, you know, squirted upon, who are going to be unleashed upon. Allow them to go and rebound most of that water, let's hope. So their argument is focused on, on countering the effects of Russian propaganda. We can't get too caught up in the propaganda itself. And by that logic, don't direct our flow of information directly back at the fire hose. Point instead our stream at whoever the Russians are targeting and try to push that audience in more productive directions. I mean, some of this language rubs me uncomfortably to say, oh my gosh, if we're talking about domestic audiences and partners as target audiences. They're not targets in a negative sense. They're selected audiences. They're discerned audiences that we're going and helping to enable to make sure that they are not going to get caught up in something that's against their interests. So near term, what do we see this meaning? Troy said it much more eloquently than I can. This all has to happen in the open. This whole shaping environment must be done overtly and explicitly. We should expect through this Russian ecosystem a whole barrage of conflicting messages about Canada as an adversary and as a friend. Right, the two examples, one a, a tweet from the embassy in Ottawa is true insofar as it stands. And we can have friendly hockey games and we should have friendly hockey games and we do have some things in common. Putin reaches out in, in February and suggests, yeah, we're open for constructive dialogue based on mutual respect and areas of common interest. That mirrors very well to what we have in our Arctic and Northern policy framework in Canada. That's not incompatible. I would argue with still acknowledging that Canada and Russia are competitors. We don't have to always think of Russia as a straight up adversary. I would be contradicting everything I've written for the last 15 years to suggest that. But instead, we still have to ensure that Canadian North American allied audiences have a sober appreciation of what str Russia's strategic goals actually are and where there's do those don't align with ours to begin to offer, and the key word is anticipatory anticipatory competing narratives. We need to get ahead of the Russian narratives or else it's gonna be very difficult for us to catch up ground. So how do we figure out new formulations of how to increase the flow of persuasive information that informs, that educates, that persuades selected audiences in a constructive, positive, healthy way to create, create resilience within our societies? And I would suggest this first of all requires as a necessary precondition a more nuanced understanding of the audiences that Russia's ecosystem is targeting, us being much more overt in our conversations or explicit in our conversations about what these vulnerabilities actually look like. And then the real hard part, what resonant messages should we come up with that will provide information in a way that is intelligible, meaningful, and useful to those particular audiences so that we can actually prepare ourselves for the next phases in this operating environment so that we're actually prepared and we don't find ourselves caught up. We'll leave it there. Love to hear your thoughts for the discussion. Troy, do you have any comments on that last uh, point? Sorry, before we move on. No, oh, this is, I'm ready for questions. This is going to be great. Well, and thank you so much for, uh, for both of you for, for giving that wonderful presentation. We, I'm just going to try to, to multitask to uh, to read through here. We have a few questions I'm going to throw to people, but I'm going to start with one from Guy Massey. And he has asked, how do Russian info ops fit into the broader under the threshold toolkit? For example, cyber elections interference. And just a follow up to that, are these proxy activities all directed 
by a kind of grand strategy, also in quotes, such as the one mentioned early in the discussion. Thanks for your question, Guy. Thank you. Uh, Whitney, you don't mind, I can start this one. Uh, it prompted uh, this hopefully to start us off a little bit. This is a really good question. It kind of gets to the point of how does this fit Russian larger thinking? What is this as part of a strategy? So what I'll start with is something that's not Arctic specific, but is part of um, a, a way to understand uh, Russian national strategic thinking uh, writ large, okay? When it comes to thinking about uh, ultimate uh, aggressions or kinetic uh, use of um, weapons to uh, to deal with issues, Russia has sort of a couple of singular goals and how it wants to conduct that. And one of those leading aspects of their strategic thinking is to uh, conduct warfare in such a way that it's uh, politically untenable for whatever nation, and especially the United States, of course. They don't want to go into all out warfare. What they often prioritize in strategy is get to a point where whatever is going on is so politically untenable that the um, belligerent has no choice but to stop and come back to the table. And this is why uh, there's so much kind of waffling and understanding, misunderstanding almost about this escalate to de escalate um, principle that is debatable at this point. But Info ops fits this narrative, uh, this this part of the strategy very clearly. If, if you're going to create conditions where uh, a confrontation is so politically untenable, it would obviously greatly benefit from a, a lot of information operations preparatory work. Whitney, you have anything to add? I think it's great. We got a whole list of questions. That was yes. that was excellent, Troy. Excellent. Thanks so much. I'm going to turn it over now um, through the Zoom to uh, Major John Basso. If you'd like to pose your question directly to our speakers, that would be great. Yeah, hi. Um, good afternoon. Um, I'm in the Canadian Army and work in the Canadian Army Warfare Center. Um, I was going to ask a question and I, and I posed it right at the beginning of the slide deck. So I think I'm going to need to um, modify my question. My original question was based on uh, one of the bullet points identifying um, malign activities. Um, and then uh, Dr. Lackenbauer, you made explicit reference, say nothing as overt as was previously talked about as far as uh, Crimea, Crimea or, uh, or, or what have you. But um, I'm gonna I'm gonna sh gonna shift because it seems the, the, the principal malign activity that we're talking about here is is a concerted and, and and growing inf information operations campaign. That is the malign activity that you've articulated. Um, there's no physical or overt malign activity. What, what I'm trying to bring myself around to, and I was writing in the chat a, a modification of my question. Do you think that the Russian efforts to seek legitimacy is in part based on their sort of, sort of wounded pride from the collapse of the Soviet Union uh, that uh, Putin himself has articulated many times and efforts to seek Western recognition that Russia is still a player. Because yeah. everything you've articulated as far as from Russian strategic goals and even within Russian messaging, both in internal audience and their messaging, albeit um, inflammatory in some cases to the West, most of their claims for legitimacy are not contested. I mean, if they're looking for, you know, um, the West to recognize, yes, you're very capable in the Arctic. Yes, you've got every right to defend your territory. Yes, you've got every right to uh, exploit the economic uh, exploitation zone and develop your northern sea route. Like these claims, if for legitimacy to the grand strategy, those claims aren't really contested. Now, in the West, we seem to interpret them as threats, which interestingly, ends up being counterproductive in my estimation for the West because it risks misallocation of resources. Um, so now I went maybe answered part of my own question, but <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm struggling to understand how, like from a strategic perspective, if we are to respond in the quote unquote West, um, where is Russian legitimacy in the Arctic threatened? 
such that this campaign has to has to carry on. No, it's great. And I, I think, John, you did, or Major Basso, you did very much answer parts of your own question. I think the way you constructed it are wonderful insights. Yes, I think it is born out of a sense of still trying to project or restore that old grandeur that was there. I think it is, what I, what I suggest is even when you talk about the incredulousness of some of Russian narratives directed towards the West, I'd laugh and say, but would Russians not say exactly the same thing about the way North Americans are constructing Russia as a threat? That in essence, we're mirroring one another, by gosh. We're doing the same tactics. Now I would say we're also looking at it through a Canadian lens, which mm. means that the whole freedom of navigation, um, non-acknowledgement of internal waters and uh, you know, assertion of uh, international transit rights are not in play. I mean, that is still a big one in terms of the Northern Sea Route and Russia's sense of its Arctic zone and what it's trying to accomplish. So I would suggest there is the one that is the, the massive piece. But in the West, have we been clear enough? Have we been coherent enough in our messaging to give those messages to Russia, to very explicitly say them, and to continuously reaffirm our respect for Russia? So I don't think we have. No, I think our narratives are confused and we trip over ourselves constantly because we don't know what kind of deliberate messaging we want to project. Do we want to articulate messages, strategic communications that say, actually put together the idea icebreaker fleets of all of the NATO countries and their partners. And we're not going to be like the Russians, but by God, we're able to accomplish a lot. Put together all of our military capabilities as NATO and even the northern part of NATO. And by gosh, we're not that far outclassed. Mm -hmm. and, and again, we, I don't think we're having those conversations. So if anything, I worry, and this kind of anticipates one of the other questions that Anna asked about, uh, and sorry, Anna, if I'm jumping ahead and, and doing that, Anna Serkin did, about if Russian narratives are pro-Russian and anti-Western, can we call North American narratives pro-North American and anti-Russian? Yeah, I think so. And again, if we are going to choose to embrace this as a competitive space where we are competing for minds of people, then it's yes. Yes, is that the way that we want to frame this? Is it about acknowledging that just speaking in terms of collective interests and common interests as most of my writing does, right? First among, you know, to put it out there, does. Is that missing the nature of how this space is actually being reshaped? So is it time for us to be much more mm. current? Or the flip side of that is, or is that playing exactly into Russian hands? Are we not just playing a mirroring game that, that is tit for, this, just, just tit for tat, right? This is definitely, so this, you got right to the point. These are great questions that are, are leading us to thinking about Russian thinking. And hopefully this also, Major Boss, I'm gonna try to answer uh, Sky Jensen's question at the same time is why, what is going on? What is What does it mean to us? Well, Russia's position, Russia trying to define the Arctic in, in its terms is going to cause great problems against the West and US as it already has when it is building up its defenses uh, for the Northern Sea Route natural resources and has the largest uh, claim in, in the Arctic as the largest state and coastline and so on and so forth, maritime domain. When the US and NATO now try to enter into the Arctic with infrastructure, building bases, NATO, even thinking about creating a, a strategy, uh, Russia has responded quite clearly that uh, it doesn't want to see this. So all of the work of Russia building up its legitimacy in uh, in the Arctic really is in one way setting up to resist and confront the United States, the West and NATO from uh, making advancements and progressing and developing into the Arctic itself. So think about this after years and years and years of Russia doing what it's been doing uh, and consistently selling this narrative and demonstrating why it needs to be in the Arctic and have such a massive defensive force. The moment NATO and the US started to do this, we got blasted, right? And, and there's that information. Excellent, thank you so much. There's been a lot of uh, 
a lot of chatter. So I'm going to try to consolidate some things. I know that Michael Young was asking some questions related to what we were mm -hmm. just talking about. Um, so uh, Michael asked, is the Russian disinformation campaign with respect to the Arctic merely a way for Russia to reclaim its own sense of legitimacy and wounded pride? Or is there a greater goal or strategy? Um, and he also asked if Russia is engaged in the shaping phase now, what actions are they planning to take in subsequent phases? Thanks for your question, Michael. Mike, yeah. Mike, I think you're spot on, absolutely. Let me stab at this first. Uh, with Russia, you know, post, post Soviet Union, the collapse, you had such a, a massive recession in time when Russia was completely degraded and diminished in, in power, trying to get to this near peer status. I think the timing is important when, when Russia started to realize uh, it was climbing out of a, a massive recession, it had economic viability again, it could start putting money back into the military and getting on that global near peer uh, competitor status again. I think the timing of the Arctic opening up was almost exactly at the same time. So as it could build its legitimacy and show the world, we're back, we are a major power, you're gonna have to deal with us. Right then and there, the Arctic was also opening up in discussion and importance. And I think it was just a natural extension for them at this point to, to uh, lean into the Arctic and show its dominance from a very powerful position. They had a very strong position in this regard. So I think it really worked right into that, that mindset that you mentioned, Mike. Um, wouldn't you want to take on that second part? Oh, sorry, which was that? That was the... Yeah, I'm not sure. You know, do we have we yeah. talked about? Do we see any thoughts I, about? I, I would love to play. It. There's the next a, a couple of threads sort of coming out of this. A couple of threads coming out of this too. I know uh, Sky Jensen. You mentioned, you know, how do you get ahead in a 24/7 media world? You know, all they have to do is push send in a message or a news story. You can't put it back in the bag. I think that's exactly our takeaway here. Is how do you anticipate that? And the whole thing here is how do we anticipate what those malign messages may be. And I think the hard part that I struggle with is a lot of what Russia is strategically messaging to me is great. It's actually well received in some of its strategic documents. The fact that a lot of its messaging and messaging is affirming the importance of indigenous rights and respect for indigenous rights, that we find ourselves in an Anthropocene where there are anthropogenic drivers of climate change, where they're highlighting the importance of environmental stewardship and cracking the skulls of people held responsible for what went down in Norilsk and stuff like that. I also don't want to give the wrong impression that this means that everything Russia is doing and all of this messaging is inherently against the interests of Canada or the interests of the West. What we need to be doing with a high degree of fidelity is discerning which of these messages, which of these narratives might be potentially prejudicial to us in what our desired end state is or what our strategies may be. So in essence, it's even more complicated to say, we need to get ahead. We need to be our own eyes wide open critics, red teaming or playing the role of understanding what this, these things might look like through Russian eyes, looking at the gaps and seams and vulnerabilities in our own societies and our own debates. And then in advance, start to say, are we ready? And are we actually having the sort of conversations or actually feeding information? So the push function, not being our typical reactive public affairs selves, waiting until after the story breaks and then trying to do damage control. The very opposite. How do we shape the narratives ourselves? Good, compelling, meaty, interesting narratives that we're building cumulatively, not just individual fire and forget stories, but narratives that are gonna be compelling, that actually achieve all of our desired effects and that are in, at the same time gonna be truthful and honest but are also going to counter some of the main arcs that, again, I'm not as worried about the pro-Russian side of it. Like, the, I, I expect Russia to be pro-Russian. It's the anti-Western part of some of these narratives and the way that we are being illegitimized as part of a strategy, because that's an essential precondition to legitimizing some Russian behaviors. That's what worries me. So, again, my point is not to counter the pro-Russian narratives. Let Russia put out its pro-Russian narratives. Instead, we want to make sure that we have good, compelling pro-Western narratives that aren't being completely overwhelmed at some point in subsequent phases by anti-Western narratives, if that makes sense. That's and in that sense, I'm also sensitive to some of the comments here about we can get overzealous, too, in trying to mount a whole anti-Russian narrative campaign. 
that seeks to delegitimize or illegitimize all of what they're trying to do with their strategies. I look at the strategies and say there's a lot here that's very interesting, you know, in terms of what Russia is trying to accomplish. Yes, I have my latent frustrations and anxieties over it because of what we know is going down with Russian behavior in other parts of the world. But another part of me says, I, there's some lessons learned I'd love to see from what Russia, Russia is trying to accomplish in the next 15 years that in the West would help us to make smart, shrewd infrastructure investments, let's say, or get the right balance between military and civilian, um, you know, synergies between capability development or infrastructure, yada, yada, yada. So again, I think that's part of our big challenge here is seeing it as a competitive environment. We frame it using the tools that we did today as a very conflictual environment. I'm not sure how, how comfortable I am with that. It's a competitive environment. And again, some of those proxy sites to deal with some of the other questions here are going to be outright conflictual in their tone and tenor. But a lot of this other stuff I think is best seen as competitive. And if we embrace the fact that that's the world that we're in and that's the way this Russian ecosystem works, we need to just be prepared to be competitive. And I use competitive as much as I can in a normatively neutral, it's neither good nor bad. It is the natural state of affairs in a scenario like this. And we, I think that's, that might, if there's a bottom line up front or a takeaway is, people like myself need to be prepared to recognize this is a competitive space. We are competing, mm. we have competing narratives. And those narratives are prerequisites to reaching our desired end states. And if we're not prepared to come up and create those narratives, then they're going to be created for us. And we're not going to be on terrain of our, of our choosing. This is um, just, to, just to add, you know, think about the, the difficulty of, of how this works when it comes to information operations is when you're dealing with pros, assume Russia is going to be absolute pro level at this stuff, being on the defense, being put into the defense mode of, of reacting and being reactionary is almost automatically a loss. Okay. We can't be responding to, um, information operations and, and, and injects against, uh, narratives or whatnot. And, and this is going to be quite difficult in, you know, in such times right now, uh, where, we're dealing with, let, let's think about a conventional threat we're dealing with right now in the form of uh, hypersonic cruise missiles. When we realize we literally have no defense against such a thing, that one of the most important um, responses and strategies we have against such a threat is to uh, either strike left of bang, which means take the missiles out or the delivery platforms before they're allowed to launch, or present such an incredible deterrence that they don't even think about launching. So in the world of information ops, we need to start thinking in the same way because once it's launched, it's too late, right? So we have a lot of other questions. Let's, I got, I'm chomping at the bit here. So what's next, Shannon? Well, I'm gonna throw it over actually to Michael Hoskin. He would like to ask his question through Zoom. So Michael, go right ahead. Hey, uh, thanks Troy and Whitney. Uh, that's good, good talk so far. Um, I kind of do a lot of sort of operational level uh, policy information dissemination. So I cover a lot of webinars. I do a weekly news roundup for Arctic News and I use sources like the Barents Observer and I make a commentary. And I, I do my best to uh, evaluate the news, the quality and make comments that, that shape the narrative. But uh, should I be putting a disclaimer at the top of these uh, things or should I, be, is that sort of just up to the reader to determine the quality of the uh, reports? No, I don't think you need a disclaimer, Michael. Thank you for all the work that you put out. I, I read uh, your, your excellent work all the time. So no, you don't need a disclaimer. I think it's the due diligence. I, I put that slide up almost as a reminder to say, you know, we do need to go through and not just embrace and potentially propagate some stories that seem to fit a pre-existing frame that we have. Um, it's just about us doing due diligence, and, and I always say to my, I'm very academic, of course, but to say the obligation is on me as the producer of commentaries or narratives to make sure that I am, uh, if I'm claiming to be objective or claiming any pretense of objectivity or claiming to be faithfully citing something, that I've done due diligence to make sure I've actually read it in its primary form and I'm arriving at my independent assessment. Uh, the story around that particular one was a, a colleague and I actually wrote a quick impact in response to that Barron's Observer story. I took it in hook, line and sinker, wrote it up, 
thank gosh it went to Troy Buffard, who kind of said, yeah, these are neat ideas, but I don't think they actually, Medvedev actually said what you think Medvedev said. And so the check and balance was there. Uh, in terms of the audience, had we put it out, my thought would have been, I would like to think that people would say, hey, well, if Whitney Lockenbauer put it out, he probably did his facts checking, so it's probably reliable. What scared me was, you know, I have the obligation as the producer to make sure that I'm doing my fact checking. I have to realize that uh, RT doesn't do fact checking the way that we do, and that Sputnik News does not do fact checking. Uh, foreign-facing news outlets have a different purpose and have different... Uh, so I think it is a, a question Nancy Teeple, Dr. Teeple mentioned, how do we encourage cr critical thinking amongst our information consumers? I think that's the big question. I think, Michael, you're asking it, and Nancy, you're putting it forward, is how do we start to educate people that these are the sort of things that are going on? And how do we also tie that in with you know, broader questions that are being raised here about you know, the whole, uh, I, I think of Duke Snyder's comment about the entire fake news, misinformation, skepticism about experts, context in which we find ourselves, which I find incredibly troubling. And it's trying to figure out as well, if you are going to do anticipatory uh, information campaigns, for example, to in advance counter potential narratives you expect to see, if those are coming out on a NORAD website, or a NATO website, like NATO's countering Russian information, you know, website that they have, our audience is going to dismiss it as, well, that's official Western propaganda. Instead, do you need to, do we need to figure out new ways of mobilizing academic community and, and journalists like yourself, Michael, and think tanks to be part of our own? And again, I don't see it as an ecosystem of our own falsehoods. I still think the West will prevail. Ultimately, if we actually hold true to our integrity and our core values, which is about truthfulness. I want us to have the integrity. I want us to be the voice and produce the narratives that will withstand the scrutiny. And yeah, that requires some creativity. And I think it does require some changes to the way we've typically done things from a public affairs standpoint, for sure. And even in terms of certain forms of journalism. Troy, you probably have lots of ideas on this. I think you covered it well. Um... Yeah, I, I think we have time for one more question. Uh, that could be an entire another ideas talk for sure, like how, how the media handles information. Um, thanks for joining us for sure though. Uh, Shannon, last question, I guess. Yes, over to me. I'm just gonna cycle through. So I wanted to thank everyone also. Um, I've been writing down the questions to pass on to the presenters. So um, some of you will have their information, some might not. So feel free to reach out to me if uh, I know that there's a lot of uh, a lot of a lot of information coming back and forth here. So I'm just trying my best to, to keep up. So I know that there was a question from Sky Jensen that you wanted to tackle, um, Troy, that uh, yes. or that will fit right in. So I'll, I'll pass it over to you. She's written a uh, or yeah. they've written a few a few things that will be helpful here. I think this is a useful topic to talk about. Uh, Sky Jensen, um, Sock North. Thank you for that question. It, it deals with sanctions. And I think this is um, one of those uh, topics that we could actually look at as sort of a case study. And there's some new information coming out of and working and learning from a colleague about how this works. But the sanctions, when it comes to the uh, to Russia and the Arctic, imposed after Crimea, with specific targeted, very precise language with regard to the Arctic offshore, for Russia, uh, targeted their their lack of technological capabilities uh, to uh, explore and produce offshore oil, as well as provide manufacturing uh, support for such platforms cut off West from supporting Russia in this, in, in this way. And we didn't hear a lot of uh, response from Russia. I mean, there was a standard one or two, like, you know, hey, we hate sanctions, you, you're, you know, you're bad. And we know what's going on as far as sanctions otherwise. It's playing very well internally to the domestic crowd. But as far as the offshore precision strike at those uh, lack of ca capacities, uh, Putin didn't blink. In fact, he took that as okay. This is the this is the time for us to do what we should be doing, which is becoming less dependent on the West, and have since built the capacity to do this, which is incredibly important for the future of their energy. When you consider that fifty percent of oil and uh, the revenues from oil and gas uh, make up the budget of Russia, energy it cannot be overemphasized in how important it is and why 
Russia invests so much in defending it. So the sanctions right now, the messaging, how Russia is responding to that. So we can think of this as a way of um, to look at how Russia uh, sort of speaks to this and, and generates information in a response. Uh, this is an area they're 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 navigating very carefully because they don't want to show their hand that the sanctions are working in any way, shape, or form. So the language they use and the timing is very important, especially for the Arctic. Almost nothing when it came to that part of the sanctions, uh, they just ran forth with uh, developing the capabilities you needed. They didn't say a word, and it. It actually worked to their advantage in the end, uh, and this is part of the reason they triggered that oil price war uh, several months ago. Uh, it was because they put themselves in a position to deal with it. it didn't quite work out the way they wanted, uh, but in the end, economically, um, the sanctions, in a way, uh, have actually worked to Russia's advantage in the end. So the messaging, the I.O., involving sanctions is, is a really neat special topic. So uh, it, it offers us a different look uh, overall. So uh, Whitney. Before you interject, Whitney, I'm going to we have to do one encore because we had a request. So we'll play one out. Um, so we had a request for uh, a follow up from Michael Young's question. Um, he, he posed uh, the IO domain might be competitive in the Arctic, but what other areas in the Arctic does the West compete with Russia in the Arctic? If one side wins, does the other necessarily lose? Sovereign resources are well-defined and not competitive. Thanks, Michael. Yeah, I think that's a great follow-up. And I mean, there are some disputes, there are tangible disputes over Svalbard and uh, certain fish resources and what kind of presence is allowable and how far Norwegian sovereignty extends, for example. Uh, certainly there are big questions about non-Arctic states and influence um, and the potential for you know, scientific practices to be a, a vector for um, nefarious activities, let's say. There are tangible, uh, you know, material areas where we, we do have competition as well. Um, but I think your point is right. And, and again, most of my writings over the years have emphasized those points of commonality and shared gains where actually um, I've never been as averse as some others are to the Arctic Five construct, for example, the Arctic coastal states sitting down and working amongst themselves on issues that are within the competency and, and legitimate purview of the Arctic states. That has to involve Russia. It must involve Russia. They are a very large, uh, player, and I, I don't see any negative outcome of continuously reaffirming a message that Russia has rights within the Arctic and that we respect its rights in the Arctic. It's also based upon a reciprocal obligation that Russia respects our rights in the Arctic. And I think that's where, you know, playing through this, yes, there are going to be some areas where we're competitors, but when asked, um, when Canada was doing its defense policy review a few years ago, I was at the, the group up in Yellowknife asked to comment with the minister and, and his team. And everybody else at that meeting, which was sort of Arctic focused, when asked, what are the, what are the top, fen, top five hotspots in the world that Canada should be focused on, had Arctic in. I was the one who said, actually, no, of the top five places where I think we're gonna find ourselves in potentially kinetic operations or, or the competition spoiling over, I don't see the Arctic as being one of those. I, I still maintain that today in 2020. So again, the context of our conversation is, here's one area where there is a competitive space. It's one that we can get ahead of. I still believe it's one that we can manage. And I don't want to leave through my enthusiasm and passion when I was presenting those points to say that this completely repudiates everything else. There's still lots of space in the Arctic to pursue areas of common interest, but those always have to be filtered and conditioned by realities of our bigger point, a grand strategic lens that also says, we also have to make sure that a narrative of cooperation or a recognition of Russian legitimacy in the Arctic doesn't also suggest that we in the West are fine with a new status quo with, after the crap they pulled in Ukraine and Syria and potentially revisionist aspirations elsewhere. Again, I don't see them taking place in the Arctic, but we have to also balance this and make sure we're really clear between what is the international level considerations and what are the Arctic circumpolar regional ones and how might Russia, for example, taking over the chair of the Arctic Council. And of course, deliberately leaving, appropriately leaving military, military security issues to the side. 
Doesn't mean they're not important. Doesn't mean that they're, they're not there. It doesn't mean they're an absolutely critical pillar of Russia's Arctic strategy, because they are. But by doing that and by emphasizing messages of cooperation through the Arctic Council, we also need to be mindful that that doesn't preclude or absolutely negate the fact that we still are military competitors. Mm. Perhaps not necessarily it. in the Arctic where that's most acute, but in a global sense, for sure. Think about also one of the target audiences for Russia too, and all of this preparation uh, and defining the Arctic in its terms and legitimizing in, in worst case scenarios, most extreme case scenarios, perhaps, if it really has to someday uh, per, uh, defend its position in some kind of international forum, even the international court, uh, or argue about uh, the interpretation of instruments like UNCLOSE, all of this consistent messaging, all of this information operation shaping is definitely going to come out as, as evidence, as consistency in the narratives and so on and so forth. Wonderful. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Uh, we ran a little long, but uh, some great discussion that was hard to hard to switch off. So I took down all of the questions. I'll be sending them on to the presenters for further thought. Uh, please uh, don't hesitate to reach out to us, um, either to myself as the network manager or uh, follow us on Twitter. So thank you, everyone. Wishing you a wonderful end to the year. And thank you for joining us. Take care.